Hello and welcome to Moderate Fantasy Violence, a podcast about pop culture and the world around it. I'm Alistair. And I'm Nick. And in this episode, we will be reviewing screenwriter Aaron Sorkin's directorial debut, Molly's Game, and then discussing how do you follow a career-defining work. But before that, Nick, do you have anything you want to recommend to our listeners? Uh, Yep. Over the Christmas period, I've been picking up a show called Line of Duty, which is a BBC police show that's been running for a few years and does always get some pretty intense chat on social media whenever it's on. So this is, again, not definitely not something I'm discovering. But it's a really good show that I, a friend of mine, Ross, who I think occasionally listens to this podcast, he's he's a bit of an Aaron Sorkin fan, so he might be listening to this episode, you never know. But yeah, my friend Ross recommended it quite highly, so I went and, I went and actually watched it, and yes, to that one's surprise, it is really good. It's it's not quite The Wire, but it's not quite portraying, you know, a complicated, multi-level portrayal of everything that's wrong with society. But it is a very sort of nuanced cop drama. It's about the anti-corruption unit who investigate, you know, bed police officers, basically. So, yeah, they do have to deal a bit with the whole, can police officers sometimes be bad question, which does give it a certain air of of interest and intelligence beyond get the baddie get the baddie but yeah i don't know how known this show is to u.s listeners nor to be fair do i know if we have any u.s listeners but yeah as I say, it seems to be a big deal here it does have what i consider to be fairly big name actors in well sort of in the what seems to happen is they've got these three actors who i'm sure are good and big in sort of bbc drama circles but i don't really know that well in fact i don't know them so much that i don't even know their names and am as we speak having to google it I'll probably cut at least some of this exciting top-notch Googling out when I broadcast this. Yeah, the main actors are Martin Compston, Vicky McClure, and Adrian Dunbar, who are vaguely familiar BBC drama names. I think I might have seen Adrian Dunbar in something. But they're not massive stars. But th- what seems to happen is every season, series, whatever, they get a slightly more known actor to play the main cop they're investigating, and they get to put on a big, conflicted performance, because it normally turns out there's a bit more to it than them just being, you know, on the take. Which, I guess, if you're coming at it politically, you could say is them trying to distill the issue of are these cops actually corrupt? But is also, you know, this is a show, a sort of show that does one story over six hours. So there needs to be a bit more to it than is the cop taking money from gangs or whatever. Yes, end of story. There does always have to be some sort of, there's a, a bit of a conspiracy going on. There's the guy they're investigating who is, as I say, usually played by a reasonably big name actor. Like, I think they've had Keely Hawes, Vandy Newton and Lenny James, who's... Probably the one Americans might know best, as he's quite a major part in The Walking Dead. And yeah, there's usually some nuance to why they're willing to bend the law, whether it's because of something with their family or something from their past. Or anyway, yeah, it's a good, it's a good mm. show. It has enough, despite the fact that it is one story spread over five to six hours. I very rarely find myself thinking, "Good, this could be shorter," like I do with a lot of you know Netflix shows. Yeah, that is a persistent problem, I guess. That when you in the switch to kind of more arc focused tv shows there's generally a sense like sometimes you feel plots could be tighter i think as you said the netflix marvel shows can suffer from this i think we've said for for most of the shows that you know there's always a bit when you feel there's a few episodes in the middle that could be sort of safely cut and then it will probably just make the whole thing paced a bit better i mean i guess it's a better approach to them to do these like series long arc plots rather than have like basically a different corrupt cop every week because that could get samey quite quickly yeah i'm not a that's well yeah that would be a more of a, a straight procedural i guess i yeah i'm not as big a fan of straight procedurals but i do enjoy eye zombie which is kind of a straight procedural combined with zombies possibly mostly because in eye zombie the arc plot has quickly become so prominent that the crime of the week is barely mentioned but i do generally prefer the sort of premium telly arc plot thing but the the, the flip side the cost of that is that sometimes they're a bit boring and slow line of duty i'm pleased to report is not boring and slow and if you have access to it and you like a good cop show then it is a good cop show and you should check it out cool and that was me alistair what have you been watching um well over the christmas period i've been reading uh, a comic hey. it was a comic recommended by nick but not through the show if you can uh, imagine such a thing as talking about comics when we're not on the podcast. But now that we're only covering one thing a fortnight, we have to occasionally recommend other things to each other. Um, so I've been reading Omega Men, which is a volume written by uh, Tom King, which I, th- I think you said is a sort of a very well-received uh, comic in the DC Green Lantern universe. Bit of a cult hit, yeah. It's sort of, it was part of 
a, a few series that has propelled Tom King quite quickly to sort of A-list status. He's now like the main Batman writer and doing quite well. Yeah, well, I, I can see why. It's a very good comic. It's got a really interesting plot. It's based around a sort of group of space revolutionaries who are trying to overthrow a, like a sort of evil capitalist exploitative uh, sort of mining operation called um, the Citadel. Um, there's various twists along the way. The plot's quite interesting, even though it's sort of quite slow paced in that, I guess, as similar as we were saying to Line of Duty, it's it's all arc plot. It's not a kind of each issue is a self-contained story. So it means the overall story, I guess, moves quite slowly, but it's very interesting. And there's there's sort of lots of twists and turns along the way, which I won't spoil. I mean, I've read, I've read Obi Gamed as well, which was why I recommend it to Alistair, obviously. And yeah, the plot, the plotting is very sort of novelistic. Like the twelve issues aren't like the serialized adventures of this character. It's very much just a twelve-part novel, which was released in twelve monthly chunks and can now be read in one book, which is probably the better way to read it. I'm very much approaching it like reading it like a novel, and each um, issue is like a sort of a chapter. Especially as they, um, there's little things that that are quite sort of similar to novel chapters in that, and there's a sort of quote at the end of each chapter. And you know, I know a lot of authors like to put um, quotes from other writers at the beginning of their chapters to kind of establish a theme or for the coming chapter. So it it works very well read that way. It's also got some um, very beautiful artwork. Um, I don't actually have the name of the the artist in front of me right now. It's Barnaby Begender. Barnaby Begender, which is um, he's done some uh, excellent work. Sometimes there's like you know sort of a whole two page spread that is just dedicated to one long fight sequence, um, and it's just you kind of you really get a sort of I don't know it really helps like the pacing. I think that the fact that kind of it's so sort of richly drawn. It means you take time over every panel, um, which really helps kind of you not sort of rush through it and feel that like it's happening too quickly. But yeah, Tom King beats things out in quite deliberate sort of usually nine panel grids and and that sort of forces you to go through each moment in a sort of quite controlled way, which if you've got a good artist gives them time to draw, you know, a different nuances of character to actually show each moment bit by bit. It's one of these things where, yes, the the symbiosis of writer and artist does work quite well. Tom King's doing this quite meticulous, ambitious format, and Barnaby Begenza does execute it very nicely. Yeah, so I'm about halfway through reading the uh, the comics so far. Um, I'm really enjoying it. I'm looking forward to the end. I'm sure there'll be some more surprises uh, before I get to the end. But so yeah, if you're uh, interested in a comic that, I guess, as Nick says, is more of a cult hit, so it might not be uh, on the radar of some of our listeners, then I would certainly recommend The Omega Men if you like a good blast of science fiction and sort of space adventure yeah i think if, especially if tom king continues on the career trajectory he's going on then this is going to be you know it, omega men is probably going to be quite well rem- remembered in the canon as one of the big good early works of someone who went on to be quite a major name okay and now our main review feature of the week it's body's game the film based on the autobiographical book by body bloom the film, of course, is written by screenwriter Aaron Sorkin, who we like a lot as former teenage West Wing fans and, well, I guess, and now adult West Wing fans. And yes, Sorkin, of course, has been working on these sort of modern-day set biopic-type films for a few years now, starting with The Social Network and moving through Charlie Wilson's War and Steve Jobs, but this is the first one he's directed himself, which makes it another big point of interest for us to take a look into. It stars Jessica Chastain as Molly and has Idris Elba and Michael Serra in supporting roles and focuses on Molly Bloom's life running underground poker games among the rich and famous and powerful in America, and the slightly less glamorous things that happen to her as a result of all that. Okay, so Molly's Game. Alistair, what did you think of it? Yeah, I liked it. It was a very good film. It's a kind of very short review. Based on my usual survey of what I hear other people saying as we sort of exit the cinema, I did overhear one person in the audience saying, he's just so talented, which I assume is them talking about Aaron Sorkins, although it could be about Idris Elba or Kevin Costner, who's also in this film. They could just talk about how hot his result is, let's be honest. Yeah, that is that is a possibility. I think that's a fair assessment of the film, in that this is a film that really shows off Aaron Sorkin's talents as a storyteller, not just as a writer, but also as a director. And I'm really pleased that he has put together what is a really good film. And, you know, there are moments when I had sort of like tears in my eyes during some of the big emotional scenes. And, you know, it was interesting and there were some sort of great character developments and great drama. There were two sort of concerns I had about the film. One which was that like the last series of The Newsroom and Steve Jobs were, I don't know, shall we say, at least good but not great. So I was a bit worried that based on some of the recent Sorkin stuff, this might be not up to his usual 
West Wing standard. I know that's a high bar to set, but as one of my favourite screenwriters, you, I really hope he lives up to kind of the promise of his previous work. And the other concern I had was that now he's writing and directing, he's been given a lot of freedom, and even great artists can sometimes suffer from having too much freedom. People being unable to hold them back. And I was worried that he would create something that was, I don't know, he wouldn't benefit from having someone there to check his power as the primary creative force on this film. But both of those concerns turned out to be uh, unfounded, and it was a great film. I too went in worrying that this was going to be a bit of a, a self-indulgent slog. I mean, you know, as you say, it was the same guy writing and directing it, nearly two and a half hours long. You know, all, all the ingredients were there, but this did hold my attention surprisingly well. I think it's probably the best of these Avon Sorkin films since The Social Network. Certainly, both Charlie Wilson and Steve Jobs had their moments, but felt a bit slight. This film, I think, whether through luck or judgement, the Bonnie Bloom story did give him a bit more of an actual narrative to hang a plot on, because you do worry sometimes that he gets a bit in love with just writing scenes and fails to actually give films much of an actual story. But no, Bonnie Bloom's story gave him both enough material to do one of his past-present flashback tricks, which he does seem to like doing, and also there was enough genuine emotion in there. I think the the first half to two-thirds is probably better than the last half to two-thirds. I think there's a bit of possible running on the spot. But I I must admit, you know, for a a two-and-a-half-hour film, I wasn't bored and shifting in my seat. I mean, to be honest, I probably felt the length of this less than I felt the length of Star Wars The Last Jedi, which was actually about the same length. So, considering I was really... I did actually go into it thinking, oh, God, is this going to be Aaron Sorkin just indulging himself at me solidly? I was quite impressed. Maybe just because he got some good actors in who had quite distinctive voices to deliver his dialogue. But I didn't actually spend that much time thinking, oh, I see we've we've entered generic Sorkin speak. There's some of it in the sort of more present day section. There's a lot of stuff in Idris Elba, who's playing Molly Bloom's lawyer, Idris Elba's office, where they're just bantering back and forth with each other, which does recall a lot of previous Sorkin work, like people with principles talking slash arguing with each other in rooms. That's very much the Aaron Sorkin way. But they're quite good iterations of it, and a lot of the past set stuff does genuinely have quite a different feel. So yeah, I actually did enjoy it quite a lot in the end. I certainly agree with all that you just said, um, and this is probably Sorkin's best bit of work since The Social Network. And you're right, it does feel less Sorkin-y than maybe some of the other Sorkin projects we've had recently. As you identified, there are some of his sort of recurring stylistic tricks, such as having a a non-linear plot. But there wasn't as much of his, you know, staple quick-fire dialogue. There was certainly no one having a meeting in a corridor um, (laughs) whilst they rush off somewhere else. So, you know, I got the feeling... Maybe he was trying to do something a bit different. Yeah, this is his directorial debut. He wanted to, I don't know, put more of an individual spin on it by doing something that's clearly quintessentially Sorkin, but not kind of just basically making a sort of a film version of The West Wing or a film version of one of his other projects that he'd written. You know, there were other sort of, you know, Sorkin themes in there. There was the main character has sort of a complicated relationship with her father, which is a reoccurring uh, sort of Sorkin theme. It's true. The lead character ends up saying something like, I don't think my father really liked me that much, which is something I think almost every Sorkin protagonist has said at some point. Yeah, pretty much. And several characters from quite a lot of their, um, from his different shows. Sometimes, you know, several, several characters in one show have plot lines related to that. <laughs> but it's one of his themes. I mean, he, like I say, he's a for Hollywood a system that doesn't have a huge focus on individual creativity. He's definitely one of the big auteurs in sort of square coats of the last few years, in that he has a distinctive style, a you know distinctive way of working, and addresses the same themes. Just as you would, if he was a novelist, this is the sort of thing that people are obviously always keen to look at. You know, stylistic similarities, thematic similarities. So the fact that the same stuff comes up again in different Sorkin's projects is kind of a sign that he's, I guess, a creative voice or an artist in a Hollywood system that isn't so much focused on individual expression. Yeah, I mean, there's a scene to, again, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly dancing around exactly what this scene involves to avoid spoilers, but there's a scene in the film where the main character has a session with a therapist, kind of, sort of, and that is something that's in all the Sorkin shows. It's also, to be honest, something this film could possibly have done without, as it did kind of, although in some ways it did help the plot, it also seems to largely be there so Sorkin could tell you what the film was about in case you'd missed it, which was, to be honest, at times, the one thing where this film sometimes fell down, there was that scene and there was a lot of first person narration by Jessica Chastain which a lot of it was quite good and quite well delivered but it did sometimes fall into the the narration trap of just telling us what we could see on the screen again in case our eyes had momentarily failed us yeah and it it wasn't didn't happen often enough for me to really 
get angry and moan about it, but it is perhaps what might hold this film back from being a truly Oscar-worthy artistic masterpiece. Yeah, there is a lot of voiceover in the flashbacks, as you say. I assume the dialogue is, of the voiceover is very similar to what's in the book that it's based on. In fact, the book itself is a MacGuffin in the storyline that's set in the present. It's kind of the book that's been adapted gets just all discussed and brought up at various points. And I assume some of the voiceover is kind of from the book. It does sound a bit like it could be that way, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jessica Chastain sells a lot of it. Like, we've talked about Aaron Sorkin a lot because... Yeah. We, we like him and that is our want. But Jessica Chastain is great at this film. Like, to be honest, if I was going to pick one thing, element or part of this film to nominate for awards, it would probably be Jessica Chastain, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Aaron Sorkin. But Jessica Chastain is amazing in this. And possibly a lot of the reasons why some of what could have felt like generic Sorkin business doesn't feel like that is because Jessica Chastain does take it and sell it yeah. in a very sort of sincere, vulnerable, yet hard, yet soft, yet... It's just a very good performance. She brings a lot to this character, who we have to spend the entire film with, obviously. Like, Idris Elba and Michael Serra and some others, Sorkin does use the poker games as an excuse to bring in some quite fun sort of character actors to do these, like, small fun parts. But mostly it's Jessica Chastain having about five times more screen time and dialogue than the next person behind her. This is a very Jessica Chastain film, and she is very up to it. Yeah, certainly. I mean, she is the core of this film, and she's in pretty much every scene. Certainly the character of Molly is, I think, the only time Jessica Chastain's not on screen is during the childhood bits when it's a younger actress playing the character Molly. And she is the core of this film, and she is what makes it a success in that she also, you know, kind of gives the the Sorkin dialogue, a sense of humanity. One of the criticisms levelled at Sorkin, and it's a sort of roundabout criticism, is that the way the characters speak in his shows or in his films is not really how real people speak. But Jessica Chastain has found a way to make it believable when she's delivering it, which really helps. And I'd also say the same for uh, Idris Elba. He's very talented, he's got gravitas. When he's delivering Sorkin's lines, you seem to a real sense of i can imagine someone someone saying this where sometimes it it, does, it can feel a bit artificial and, and you listen to his dialogue and you think this is very well written but no one really talks like this no one's this kind of well informed and quick fire i also thought michael sarah was really really good playing a character quite different to the characters he normally plays this character's a you know, a bit dark, almost it's kind of sociopathic at times. It's one of these characters who's a bit charming, but also it's clearly underpinning this sort of self-centred, unpleasant greed. Yeah. I also like the fact that the character he plays is a top-flight Hollywood actor, kind of the main celebrity draw for one of the poker games that Molly runs. And I like the fact they never tell you the name of the actor Michael Cera is supposed to be playing, so you're kind of left with the sense that maybe it is Michael Cera himself, They only call the character Player X, and she's very clear that she's not revealing the names of any of her celebrity clients to protect their anonymity. So I would left to walk away thinking, was that Michael Cera playing himself? I think it probably wasn't, but yeah, there is quite a fun montage where they use lots of old magazine covers, and I think there's a bit of red carpet footage of Michael Cera to create the, you know, the this is a big celebrity thing, when it's clearly meant to be i think it's meant to be someone else i did actually see some speculation on the internet about who it's meant to be but i don't know if i should repeat that here or not in case it might be libelous but yeah it's i think it's meant to be someone else yeah but it was a good performance i thought he was very good kevin costner's very good very much in the stage of his career where he plays father figures to you know superman or kind of elite poker hostesses again a bit of a sorkin staple but what are you going to do this sort of unsympathetic yet in a strange way kind of sympathetic but also not sort of awful father figures. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, on the subject of Sorkin's direction, in some ways it's a very televisual film. Like, if you grabbed me afterwards and said, actually, what you've just seen was like a two or three part glossy HBO miniseries put on the screen, then I would have just gone, yeah, right, yeah, sure, probably. Because, yeah, it doesn't quite have an epic sweep to it. It is well told, and, you know, Sorkin has clearly picked up how to direct his own dialogue after years of, I guess, watching and helping other people do it. I don't know, I, mean, I think it's probably quite hard to make... Sorkin's slightly theatrical, very talky scripts seem, like, massively cinematic. Like, David Fincher pulled it off in The Social Network by making it very heavily stylized. I'm not sure Danny Boyle really pulled it off in Steve Jobs, to be honest. <laughs> there were a few bits where he was clearly trying to, you know, make us see this as something infinitely more majestic than just people talking in rooms. Like, there's a bit where a load of, like, metaphorical montage images just appear on a wall or something in Steve Jobs. Yeah. It's a bit weird. And clearly it's Danny Boyle trying desperately to liven up this talky talky script he's been given and Sorkin doesn't do anything massively dramatic to liven up the talky script except at the beginning where there's a bit of sort of slightly quirky indie film on screen arrow drawing stuff which is kind of fun and does at least give the film a bit of flavour to get going with 
But yeah, yeah. But once we settle into it, it is just people talking in rooms shot fairly straight. And although it's fine and you can always tell what's going on, it's not a virtuoso directing performance. He hasn't massively elevated it or anything. It's just, it's fine. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's always a sense of tension going on, which I think is very important in that films that are, well, can be boiled down to basically people in rooms talking. It's really, you've got to make sure there's always a sense of something at stake. There's always a sense of tension or else it does become, you know, sort of just empty dialogue. I think in the previous episode, I was talking about uh, watching Iron in the Sky, starring Alan Rickman. And that's, again, another film that is, in essence, just people talking in, in rooms, debating whether they're going to fire a missile or not. But there is, again, a sense of there's, there are consequences, there's something at stake, there's dramatic tension underneath the people talking in rooms. And Sorkin's really nails that, which is challenging if you're going to have a you know a film that doesn't have you know explosions or battles or heartbreaks and kind of searing personal drama it is kind of people discussing their principles and he's very good at making sure there is you know a sense of tension to be honest this might well be what differentiates it from charlie wilson's war and steve jobs which again were fine but in body's game i did have a certain amount of edge of my seat oh what's going to happen i actually care due to the way sorkin has built the story and the way jessica chastain has played the sort of likable toughness of molly and i did actually you know care about what happened and want to see her come out on top and you know i was actually worried she might not and you know all those the things that are meant to happen in films i hear yeah there were a few bits that i don't know i have a few criticisms it wasn't perfect i say there was like some of the poker bits did kind of feel like i was just being rushed through something quite complicated um, which I didn't really understand. Again, to Silken's credit, he always gives you a gist. You always understand basically what's going on enough to follow the plot. And you don't need detailed knowledge of poker. But there are some bits when, especially in the voiceover sections, it hits you with a lot of uh, detail about different poker hands. In fact, there's even points when graphics are sort of flashing up in the screen telling you which cards are in the river, which cards each player has. You know, I got the sense that this is just kind of, I mean, bamboozled with a lot of information. Like I say, it's not essential to follow the plot i got the sense actually it was put there so that anyone who really knows poker won't think like oh they're just this is just bullshit this isn't like proper poker because if they understood the poker they could see exactly why it was important that this character had a king and that character had a queen or or whatever but it it did feel yeah like being bamboozled with a lot of a lot of information, which is something that Sorkins has been better at in the past. I mean, the West Wing is very good at it kind of explaining the key points of politics and then having a dramatic scene. And you completely understand how the political shifts are impacting the plot. I mean, it is a TV show, so it's got longer to explain itself and develop itself. Or the social network also doesn't suffer from this, but maybe that's partly because we're all on Facebook. We don't need it explained to us. But... <laughs> The social network didn't get bogged down in details of coding or finance or business structure. He managed to get to the human story right at the heart of this. And although Molly's game is very much about the human story at the heart of this, there were some times when I felt the plot is a bit too much focused on the machinations of professional poker players. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, th- I thought he just about pulled off, for, for, for me, from my perspective, I thought she just about pulled off the, as you say, the West Wing trick of, OK, I've used enough of the words to make it sound like these people know what they they're doing but i've also through the characters reactions to the words i've made it clear enough what the implications of the words are so yeah i mean i don't know a few years ago i read the book for richer for poorer the poker-based autobiography of victoria Cullen. so maybe i just about picked up enough poker for that to be able to follow this film better i don't know again not that i'm pretending to be good at poker i am not good at poker i played a few times at university and lost all my money thankfully we were only playing for pennies so it was about two quid yeah i don't know as i say for me he just about hit the west wing balance of enough words to tell what you're talking about enough sort of focus on the character reactions for it not to get in the way of the story but your mileage may vary everybody yeah but i mean that's just sort of a light criticism in the sense that maybe something for him to bear in mind next time if Sorkins listens to this podcast. Hi, love your uh, work. <laughs> yeah, but overall, you know, absolutely excellent. And like I say, if you were someone who was maybe left a bit cold by Steve Jobs, as I think we both were, or at least, you know, it wasn't clearly as good as, say, The Social Network, or if you felt that, like, in the Newsroom Series 3, it's a bit like, well, you've got your regular points, Aaron, and you're kind of hammering them a bit this time. It's becoming a bit samey. Or if you were concerned about, <laughs> you know, too much freedom can be a bad thing for alter creative types. Sometimes they need someone to rein them in. I, I wouldn't worry about that, and I'd go see Molly's game because it's very good, and Sorkins is on fine form here. And at no point does a character go off on one about how awful the internet is. He managed to avoid that as well, which is uh, which is good. I mean, don't get me wrong, the internet is awful. Like, the internet is a godforsaken wasteland full of Nazis, as we've all established. But, you know, there doesn't mean a need to go to a film about poker and be told that again by Aaron Sorkin. Because even when Aaron Sorkin is right about these things, he just 
just sounds a bit too much like, you know, an old man screaming at the internet to get off his lawn. Okay, related question time now, and this fortnight, how do you follow a career-defining work? This is obviously a reference to The West Wing, the show which has hung over Aaron Sorkin's career, rather, as the big thing that defines all his subsequent work. Everyone loves it, everyone compares things to it. But yeah, there are a lot of creators out there who do their one big thing, and then, for better or worse, spend the rest of their career sort of being constantly compared to it. You know, you can see it with musicians who do endless interviews up being asked about their big album from years ago rather than their new one. So yeah, what what does one do after one has done one's career-defining thing? Should one just retire and go and live in a bin? Alistair, what do you think? Well, I think the one thing to avoid is to try and basically continue to do the same thing, but with ever-diminishing returns. And I think Sorkins maybe fell into that trap a bit at first, such as I kind of felt that Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, his follow-up show to The West Wing, interesting that it was, did feel like he was trying to do a sort of a West Wing-type thing in a different setting and it just wasn't quite as good same a bit with the newsroom which was maybe a bit better but also suffer from a similar problem in that there was the same type of dialogue the same setting a lot of the same themes and kind of dynamics between the characters even like the same kind of episode title card sequence across the west wing studio 60 and the newsroom and there was a sense of although this is good and i'm very entertained by sorkin's dialogue i do feel that like these are kind of the west wing transplanted to different offices with a sort of sense of diminishing returns but with his film work he's kind of got away from that a bit more so it's not a fait accompli yeah i think i don't know i think sorkin has perhaps fallen particularly hard into this like you know christopher nolan another big auteur director writer type of our times in fact i think mostly director he doesn't entirely write his own stuff by himself does he he's managed to not just be the batman guy for the rest of his life so you know but apparently it is possible yeah there are people who have these sort of big hits and then kind of have later success again you know i think martin scorsese is a good example obviously he had his big 70s films like taxi driver and raging bull and then kind of tried some other different things but then you know to greater or lesser success then came roaring back with goodfellas in the uh in the early 90s it's, you know it's possible to have a kind of huge career second act it's weird though because we both i think read bits and bobs about how to have a career as a writer and stuff i guess inevitably this is probably going to come back a bit to being a writer and a lot of the advice does say you know find your niche and then aggressively go towards it you're meant to then somehow work out okay at what point have i worked too hard in my niche or at what point do i need to decide okay do i want to really dig myself into this niche or am I trying to be some sort of massive broader presence who wants to transcend niche and sit across society like a colossus yeah which is something Aaron Sorkins is sort of trying to do and I think that these biopics that he's been doing recently he's kind of been focused more on an individual less on an ensemble I mean those tv shows West Wing Studio 60 Newsroom are very much ensemble pieces and I think he's more interested on how one person can have a big impact on society. You know, someone like Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs. Yeah, I know, but it's, it's weird. He seems to have gone from what was becoming a bit of a constrained niche on TV to, if anything, finding a bit of a, a similar niche in film. Like, the last couple of times I've seen a new Aaron Sorkin film announced, I can't pretend there hasn't been a degree of, oh, uh, I see he's doing a biopic of a recent single genius person. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah, he's the modern biopic guy. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, he's gone from being the, the principal people arguing in offices guy in TV to the modern biopic guy in film. I mean, I mean, I don't know, maybe this, it's just because we follow his career in more detail than the average person and therefore we're more likely to notice these things, but it just seems very strange that he's decided to go from one quite clear constrained section to another quite clear constrained section. If this was a bid to get away from clear constrained sections, he appears to have fucked it up. Yeah, I think though there's an element in terms of Following on from you know, the West Wing being a career-defining work, in his film work, he has, I think, pushed the story he's telling forward, in a, but usually through the collaborations he's been doing. So The Social Network's directed by David Fincher, who's uh, very good at making thrillers, you know, like directed Seven and other films. And he really found the thriller in a story about betrayal and also just about students and then setting up a business. He managed to find the kind of thriller in that and bring out the tension, the style. And also that was partly done through an amazing soundtrack by Trent Reznor. And when I look at the social network, I think this is not just an Aaron Sorkin's project. It's got an Aaron Sorkin's script, but it's got that amazing score and it's got that brilliant direction. Whereas The West Wing is great and it's got some great performances 
um, a lot of actors, there's too many actors to name now who were brilliant in the West Wing, but there's a lot of them. But I do feel the core of the West Wing is Aaron Sorkin's writing and his characters. With The Social Network, there, it is like a collaboration of lots of people pushing this story to be all it can be. Steve Jobs, you know, similar thing with uh, having, you know, Danny Boyle doing some very... I was about to say very visual directing, but all directing is visual. But it's a very stylish directing. And also like Michael Fassbender being like one of the, I guess, the great actors of this moment. Him sort of trying to do this this very, um, I don't know, detailed sort of complex performance. And then with Molly's game again, he's done again. He's trying to bring in more collaboration, pushing it forward a bit. So there is a sense of trying to progress post-West Wing. Yeah, there wasn't much progression in the film Steve Jobs, though. It was just, oh, he's older. Cool. There's no plot, is there? At least Molly's game feels like it actually has a plot. It does, yeah. I mean, again, especially with writers, is, because I mean, there are a lot of these big writers who, big writers with specific voices who you follow and then they burst onto the scene and you get excited by the sounds they have and the style they have. They do a load of work. I don't know, there's a, a lot of these. There's Aaron Sorkin, Christopher Nolan, Stephen Moffat. In comics, there's people like Brian Bendis and Warren Ellis. There's probably other people in other mediums. And you read a lot of their stuff and eventually a lot of these writers have a very specific sound and rhythm and storytelling style and you get used to it to the point that it almost starts to sound like self-parody when they release a new thing and lo and behold it sounds and feels a lot like everything else they've done and then he's like oh to bring in a Stuart Lee joke and repeat it and bastardise it it's like oh I see it Stephen Moffat again doing his story with his dialogue it's one of these things where I guess if you're just listening to the same guy trying to do the same things over and over again it's kind of inevitable it's going to sound similar but it unavoidably has less impact and it goes from being the big new hit to just that guy playing to this diminishing audience of fans. Yeah, I mean that's the the diminishing returns by repetition. I guess when you've had such a huge success like The West Wing that must be something that's on your mind that you want to get out from behind it to a degree but also kind of not make it kind of well I had my big hit and then everything else since then has been a kind of peer limitation of that you know I do like the fact he's trying new things trying different things you know now he's trying directing and stuff which is you know another way to progress his career and progress the story he's trying to tell so I don't know it's difficult to say if any post West Wing projects have lived up to the West Wing I mean the West Wing's such a big piece of work but you know he's still I think making great material the social network I think is one of the best projects he's ever done so there there is a sense of him trying to push forward and trying to create more great work in the sort of Sorkin's mould. Yeah, the social network was good because, yeah, as you said, for all the reasons you said earlier, it felt like he was trying to innovate. The fact that he then managed to use, just use that as a, a stepping stone to falling into a different slight niche or rut is, you know, unfortunate. But, you know, maybe at least that leaves you with the belief that he could innovate again. I mean, a lot of this might just be, you know, critical snottiness here. Like, soaps keep going fine. A lot of TV shows that I would never watch keep going forever. A lot of comics I don't read keep going forever. I mean, a lot of this desire to change and innovate and break out of your niche, you know, maybe that's important if you want to be recognised as, you know, a game-changing mega-creator, which maybe people like Sorkin do, but if maybe... Maybe it doesn't actually matter. Maybe you can just find your niche and serve it. I think it's partly motivated by wanting to still do your best work and not be the source of creator when people say, you know, oh, their best work is clearly behind them. For example, Francis Ford Coppola did have a problem that he wasn't able to get out from behind the best work that he did in the 70s. Like He made The Godfather, The Godfather Part 2, and then later Apocalypse Now, like three absolutely amazing films. And since then, there's always been a sense of, I don't know, whenever a new Francis Ford Coppola film comes out, there's always a sense like, well, it's not The Godfather, is it? It's not Apocalypse Now. I mean, which is maybe unfair on those films because he's done good films post the 70s, but there's always this sense that that was when he was doing his best work. And I guess on some level, you don't want to be that artist, the sort of person when he goes like, well, in the 90s, he was doing his best stuff. Now, maybe... Not so much. There were a lot of bands from, I liked when I was younger, but I get the feeling I'm the only person who still cares when they release an album. I mean, there was a new Ash album two years ago. It was okay. Don't get the feeling many people gave a shit. You know, there were a lot of bands like that. Who, it seems particularly prevalent in music for some reason. You have your big, big smash normally on your first couple of albums, and then you either disband the band and do something else, or you plug on in obscurity to your dedicated hardcore fans for the rest of your life. Yeah. That seems to be a particularly hard thing to escape in music unless you're one of the like handful of bands every so often who break out and become huge or even bands that break out and become huge for a short period of time eventually will go back into their regular audience and just kind of keep making albums for their fans i mean the kinks made albums up until the 1990s people don't really realize that they think of them just as a 60s band you know and there's definitely bands i followed like the levelers covered previously on this podcast who had you know a few re- like really big albums in the sort of the 90s, or at least a big for an alternative band at the time, and since then have been doing 
similar sort of stuff to their hardcore fans. So, I mean, it hap- like I say, it happens in music. There's always a desire to maybe do something new or maybe to try and like push forward, maybe to get back to mainstream success or at least so you don't get the feeling that you're kind of just repeating the same material over and over. Well, yeah, that's how you get the sort of creative fantasy. But the best thing to do is make your two or three definitive works and then just sort of fade away rather than just be the guy who's still plugging away diminishingly throughout the next couple of decades. But of course, if you're the person doing the work, you don't want to. Well, firstly, you may, you may well have bills to pay or a drug dealer to pay off or something. So you probably may not have this option to just go, right, well, I've made my big creative contribution. I'm just going to sit down for the rest of my life now. And partly, you know, you want to believe that you still, you know, have something to say or something to do or, again, but arguably being snotty arseholes. If you can make your fan base happy by continuing to do your thing, then... Who cares if you're seen as innovative or not, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, that's the big question. It's like, would Nirvana be seen as the kind of the rock legends that they are now if they'd released another six or so albums, each of them increasingly paler imitations of Nevermind? Or would James Dean be seen as such a legend if he hadn't only made about three films before he died? Sometimes it's better for your uh, your infamy um, or the sort of the way you're viewed in the long term is to make a few great projects than go out in a blaze of glory. But like you say, yeah, that's a probably depressing for the individual involved or be you know if you've got bills to pay then you've got to think of something i mean also the two examples i chose there they basically created iconic work and then had to stop because the main person involved died yeah so that's not really an option for everyone not without getting into some pretty depressing podcast territory no I mean, I guess it doesn't stop you being a legend if you plug on, I suppose. I mean, like, I gather Iron Maiden are still going, but you still hear Iron Maiden and think legendary rock band. You know, just don't necessarily think about the fact the stuff they're still doing now. Yeah, that's that fair much. enough. So, you know, the dream is real, guys. As long as you remember not to turn out to be a sex offender or serial killer, you can, you know, do amazing work, keep working, and still be credible. I think the difference, though, between music and TV, books, or film is that with music, you can tour and just play the hits. Yeah. Whereas... I mean, as Aaron Sorkin's probably could is made for the rest of his life on DVD sales or Amazon streaming sales of The West Wing. But, you know, Iron Maiden still tour. I don't know how much of their new material they pay. I can imagine it's a lot of the old hits. I mean, I went to see U2 in concert and I haven't really liked a U2 album for over 10 years. But they did a bit of their newer stuff. But yeah, they played the big hits of the 80s and the 90s, which is what people came to see when you go to see U2. But you can't really do that so much with film in that you have to kind of, to some degree, be creating new stuff. If you're going to keep creating, you can't just kind of play the hits. You can just bang out box sets and do podcasts or whatever, but I guess it's not. it probably doesn't really feel creative in quite the same way. No. Or of course, there is, to be fair, in our terrifying modern world, there is now the option of the completely unnecessary bolted-on sequel if you want to try and elongate your success. Yeah, and I really hope they don't try to do some kind of resurrect the West Wing and have a, another series set in the Santos administration. Or That would just be um, probably not very good. That has actually come up on Twitter lately. Really? Well, because like, they're doing this West Wing weekly podcast, which has brought the West Wing back into the discourse a bit. There has been a bit of revived chat among like the old cast members and... Aaron Sorkin via other people because Aaron Sorkin obviously doesn't use the internet because he knows if he was ever seen to have a Twitter account he would be immediately denounced as a massive hypocrite but he has mumbled about the vague possibility of it but I don't know if he'd ever actually do it well you are very much setting yourself up for comparisons to the West Wing if you try to do a direct sequel to the West Wing I mean as I said in our review of Molly's game it is somewhat unfair that all of Sorkin's work gets compared to the West Wing even when he tries to do something like Molly's game which is completely unrelated to politics but it's still unfair that pretty much all of his stuff gets held to that standard and every Aaron Sorkin's fan is just thinking is this the time he finally eclipses the West Wing but yeah if you make a direct sequel to the West Wing you are very much inviting those comparisons and they're unlikely to be favourable because the West Wing is so good I mean we keep saying the West Wing but what we really mean is the first four series that Aaron Sorkin's wrote we're not really talking about favourable comparisons to the other three oh yeah but I think we can safely assume when we're talking about West Wing and Aaron Sorkin in the same sentence we probably don't mean the West Wing episodes that Aaron Sorkin had nothing to do with which are also clearly inferior to the ones that he did have something to do with yes they had their moments but they're not as good yeah I don't know I did mention in the Bodies Game review that to be honest every time Aaron Sorkin makes a film a part of me does think oh maybe I can make a TV show but you know that that's subjective to the point of self-parody but that is always what i on some level think but to be fair considering the last time he went back and made a tv show it was widely mocked and arguably often not that great 
part of me wonders if even I want him to go back and make a TV show, even though I still think that. So God knows what my relationship to my own psychology is at this point. Well, I'd like him to go back and make, you know, a good TV show that I'm really interested in. I would, <laughs> I'd prefer him to make films like Molly's Game than TV shows like The Newsroom. But then again, yeah. I'd prefer him to make TV shows like The West Wing than films like Charlie Wilson's War, which isn't bad. It just didn't light my fire. Well, yeah, maybe that's the, the way to reconcile it. It's like, I'd just go back and make a good TV show. Maybe, maybe consider making a TV show or something other than behind the scenes at a TV show, because I feel like you may have exhausted that well at this stage. After three separate shows, only one of which was good. Yeah, something new. I suppose that's how one way how you get out from behind your career-defining work. Do something that is very different. Do something new and different, yes. That's what we want. That's all we have time for. If you have enjoyed this episode of Moderate Fantasy Violence, then please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also visit our website, moderatefantasyviolence.com, where you can listen to back issues of the podcast and read bonus material written by Nick and myself. You can also follow us on social media. We can be found, I think, by typing Moderate Fantasy Violence into both Twitter and Facebook, and our logo, It's Purple, should pop up. And yes, say hello. Tell us what you think of what we're talking about. Okay, cool. I've been Nick Bryan. You can find me on the internet at nickbryan.com, and you can find comics I've written at comics.nickbryan.com, and those are going up at the rate of about twice a month. They're quite fun. Check those out. I've been Alistair Ball. You can follow me on Twitter where I'm at Alistair J.R. Ball, and you can find more of my writing at redtrainblog.com. Join us next time, where we'll be discussing Paradiso, a new dystopian sci-fi comic from Image by Ram V and Dev Maria Pramanik. We'll be reading the first two issues, so if you want to catch up with us for the next episode, please go ahead. We'll speak to you then. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah, well, yeah, at least in this film, Kevin Costner did get himself killed trying to stop Superman from being a hero, so already things are improving. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, I hold Man of Steel against everyone who was in it.